Today, we're diving into a 2024 Fantasy Football Dynasty Rookie Mock Draft. And this is our first edition. We got Dylan, new member of the channel. He'll be bumping out a lot of content with us. And this is a super flex mock draft, by the way. So let's get started with Dylan's first pick. The one-on-one, who do you got? Yeah, uh, big debate here. Not really. Uh, we're going to be going Caleb Williams, quarterback out of USC. A lot of talk about this guy potentially being the next Patrick Mahomes-esque type of quarterback. Don't put words in my mouth. I didn't tell you he's going to be the next Patrick Mahomes, just that he'll play like him. I still think he's the consensus 101 in the real NFL draft. Um, and if that sees him landing in Chicago, he'll have a weapon like DJ Moore. If a team trades up, you know he'll be their franchise guy. He's mobile, great arm talent. How much more do I really need to say about Caleb Williams at this point? Yeah, I agree. I don't know where else you can go with the one-on-one besides Caleb Williams, especially if he's the one-on-one in real life. In a super flex format, you got to take that QB value. And it seems like he's getting so much recency bias. Like, let's not forget this kid's been a stud since his freshman year at OSU. Had two bad games, and it kind of seems like everyone's, like, trying to write him off. And in my opinion, from what I've seen on the tape, definitely need to dive more. It seems like a lot of his mistakes where he's trying to do too much with the ball. It's not that he doesn't. It's not that he lacks anything. It's that he has more than he knows what to do with, in my opinion, if you agree with that as well. Yeah, I think, um, you know, he's the kind of guy that once he gets into an NFL system, he'll certainly become a lot more polished. But all the intangibles are there, man. And it's, it could be a similar thing to Mahomes, right? Out of Texas Tech, a lot of turnovers. Um, then he sits a year in an Andy Reid system behind Alex Smith. And he came out his sophomore year, the first time he got to play, and was just absolutely guns blazing. Now, I don't think Caleb sits a year, but I do think once he gets to the NFL system, if he can get an offensive-minded coach, sky's the limit. Totally agree. I'm going to go with – I know I talked about these quarterbacks are so important, but I'm going go, to go with Marvin Harrison Jr. at the 102. I had a Drake May. It just seems like he's such a sure thing. Like, I already have him penciled in right with Jamar and Justin Jefferson the moment he steps on the NFL field, assuming he gets that. He'll probably get top three draft capital, top five. It seems like a lock at this point. Hopefully he goes to a good landing spot. I wouldn't mind the Cardinals. So we'll see how that shakes out. They keep Kyler Murray. But what else do we really need to say? He's just been an absolute stud, saying at six foot four, elite speed, elite jumping ability. He can go up and get any ball and then has that fantastic route running as well. Don't yeah. know if they're – Needs to be much else said, but Drake may just a little too risky for me. I don't know if you go elsewhere, but I, I think I'm going to go Marvin Harrison, even though he is not a quarterback in a super flex format. Yeah, I think Marvin Harrison's a great pick, especially in this format. Um, shelf life of wide receivers is there, and Marvin Harrison's got all the tools of a wide receiver who could have a long career. You know, out of OSU, a great wide receiver school, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave. Those guys are saying that Marvin Harrison is the best wide receiver out of the bunch to come out. You already have a taste of what that school could produce in those guys. I don't think you can go wrong there. I'm going to be honest. I thought about it at the 101. I think this guy is the most surefire prospect in the NFL draft, even more so than Caleb. So it's not a bad pick. I agree with that. I think he definitely has a case for the 101. If you're playing on a 1QB, I'd definitely go Marv, but... In 2QB, just because we see, like, in the first round of startup drafts, if you get that elite quarterback, they're going one through seven off the board almost immediately. Justin Jefferson, maybe. But it's just how valuable they are in a super flex format where you kind of got to give the tiebreaker to the quarterback and kill Williams. But what do you think at the 103? Yeah, so I think this is going to be the first real controversial pick here. I don't think many people are going to push back on you on the Marvin Harrison, but I'm skipping over Drake May. You know, some people are saying he's the next Justin Herbert. I'm just not as bought in. And if in a dynasty league, I'm going to put my pick on guys that I truly believe in. Give me Malik Neighbors out of LSU, wide receiver university. This guy's an absolute stud, assisted Jaden Daniels heavily in getting that Heisman Award. I get it that LSU wasn't the playoff college football team that some people projected them to be. It was not because of Neighbors. This guy's NFL comp is Stefan Diggs. He's a projected top 10 pick. Could see him finding a home on the Titans where he could easily be their wide receiver one or even the Falcons who, if they can get the quarterback situation right, whether that's bringing in a Kirk Cousins, trading for a Kyler Murray this offseason, 
Neighbors could fit right in there with Drake London and Kyle Pitts and be a dangerous young core as a receiving group. I love what this kid brings, and I'm never going to knock an LSU wide receiver. Yeah, that's valid. I really think Malik Neighbors should – I mean, it seems like I'm only putting Drake May ahead of him in my rankings right now because he's a quarterback. But the real like truth here is that Malik Neighbors is probably – a more surefire prospect at the wide receiver position. I mean, I love Marvin Harrison. I had him at the 102, but he he statistically had a better season than him this year. Yes, he had Jane Daniels and Marv had Kyle McCord, which is a <laughs> massive difference. Yeah. Kyle McCord's so bad. Like, he just is terrible. But still, like, M- Malik Neighbors is that guy. I'm still going to go Drake May at the 104 because of that quarterback value. Like you kind of talked about, he has shades of Herbert. It's just not enough to where I can definitively say, oh, I I think he has a really strong chance. Like Williams, I think he has a really strong chance because he shows like shades of Mahomes and that next level improviser. I just haven't seen it enough from me where it just really looks like he has a little bit of shades of Herbert, but he just kind of reminds me of that, you know, stereotypical stand in the pocket guy has that elite, perfect NFL size that coaches are going to like, which gives him great shelf life. I'm just not sure if he's going to be around forever. And, you know, after two, three years, he's kind of just standing in place and is, you know, average. Is he ever going to be like a top 12 dynasty quarterback? Maybe not. And would I rather have, you know, a top 12 wide receiver one over that in a Superflex format? Yeah, I probably would. But I'd still think we're going to have to take May here. What are you thinking about that pick? And I mean, I, I, I'm just not bought into Drake May, if I'm being honest. Maybe it's the Mitch Trubisky coming out of UNC as a high pick overall that still has me scarred a little bit. Uh, but I just – I'm not bought into the kid. Um, I, I'm more bought into the guy that I'll take at 105, the guy that I would have taken at 104, and that's Jaden Daniels. Even if he's not an excellent passer – this guy's getting comped as the best rushing quarterback since Lamar Jackson. And when you have that kind of speed and mobility at the quarterback position, what that gives you in fantasy as the way that scoring stands is a huge floor. Look at Justin Fields last year. Guy was a top 10 quarterback. When he's healthy, that mobility is there. Same for Lamar Jackson. Jaden Daniels, you get him good weapons. You've seen what he could do at LSU, went out and won a Heisman. But even if he doesn't, he's enough of a weapon himself that he can get you enough fantasy value. We saw a similar thing this year with Anthony Richardson. Remember, early on, no Jonathan Taylor on the Colts. Richardson was still producing at a high level because of his mobility. I expect the same out of Jaden Daniels early. Right now, mock drafts have him going as the third quarterback off the board to the commanders. I like that spot. Terry McLaurin's an underrated wide receiver. You got Curtis Samuel, Jahan Dotson, Brian Robinson. Good offensive pieces around him to succeed. I'm taking Jaden Daniels 105. I'm going to say this. if Jaden, It all depends on draft capital for Daniels. If he goes in the mid to late first round, I think I'm taking him here at the 105 because of that rushing upside. If he goes I think he's very a top 10 high, pick. Oh, yeah, 100%. If he goes top 10, I honestly, I'm moving him ahead of May. And I might have to move him ahead of Malik Neighbors because he has insane rushing production. He had a thousand rushing yards in college. And let's keep in mind, they get negative yards for getting sacked. So take it out of the context. That is absolutely nuts. If he goes in the second round, we're definitely going to have to bump him down because he doesn't have that guaranteed job security. So assuming he's a first round pick, no matter what, he's going to put up, you know, close to top 12 fantasy seasons. As long as he's starting, even if he's not a great real life quarterback. Because of that rushing upside, however, if he's a second-round pick, maybe he only gets one year, isn't great, they move on from him, and obviously you're not wanting that on your team. So draft capital is 100%, you know, where it all lies with Jane Daniels. And I'm going to go – I really want to take another quarterback at the 106, but I'm going to hold off. I'm going to take Romo Dunze. I feel like I have to take him here. He's just been so good uh, in Washington, dominated, posting a 75 75- 1,145 yards and seven touchdowns season as a sophomore. And then this year, 81 passes caught, 14, 28 yards and 13 touchdowns. He can go up and get the ball. I've watched a lot of Washington film and games. He can go up and get the ball like I haven't seen in a while. He is unbelievable. He can win any way. He can win through 
the short level, medium, and deep deep ball. He's just nuts. He he I, it does concern me. I've seen some brief analytics that his jump ball or contested catch rate dramatically improved this year. I believe it's like 23 to 73%, which is a very large spike. And a lot of that probably has to do with Michael Penix because those balls are on the money every time. We'll talk about them later. But I, I think we'll take that with a grain of salt. It's probably a little bit of Penix, but also probably a little bit of just Odunze's development. So I'm going to take a step back on him being an absurd, unbelievable elite jump ball receiver and that deep threat guy. It's just he, He's very good. He's very good. Yeah, uh, I don't hate the pick. As an Oregon Ducks fan, I saw too much of Romeo Odunze this season for my liking, but there's no denying the talent that he has. At the 107, listen, and then when we start to get the second half of first rounds, early second round of dynasty rookie drafts, it's time to start taking your shot on players that you believe in. And there's some quarterbacks on the board here. In my opinion, it could be a little weaker. I'm not sure if these guys are franchise guys, but a guy that I know that's going to be drafted to be a franchise weapon is Georgia tight end Brock Bowers. And He's got shades of Travis Kelsey, Rob Gronkowski, at least at the collegiate level. I know this guy's a winner. I know he can fit seamlessly into an offense. You know, Kyle Pitts was touted as a great tight end prospect. I think Brock Bowers is even better. Um, you know, right now I'm seeing the Tennessee Titans as a potential landing spot. Wherever he goes, I think he makes an immediate impact. We've seen some rookie tight ends this past year kind of, make it a little less scary that you can get immediate production. Sam Laporte has been excellent this year for the Lions. Dalton Kincaid starting to come around. So I don't mind taking Brock Bowers here. Again, I think it's important to note in the second half of these uh, mock drafts, a lot of times it will be based on your team construction. But as the prospect, give me Bowers. Totally agree. I think one of the easiest things to spot out in dynasty scouting is rookie fatigue. And it seems like Bowers has been the tight end one in this class for so long that people are, it's not that he's had a bad season. He just got injured. Has it been amazing? It's just a lot of these guys like Jane Daniels, Romo Dunze, Malik neighbors are kind of jumping him. So not a knock to him. I think if the season started and everything was the same, he'd probably be around the one Oh four to one Oh five conversation. He's definitely, you would definitely want that elite tight end since it's so hard to come by in dynasty, even though the market is looking up for the top tier guys, but I love that Brock Bowers pick. At the 108, I don't know how you feel about this. It, he has a very wide range of outcome, but I'm going with my guy, Michael Penix. I love Michael Penix. He's one of my favorite prospects, and I know he has the age concerns. He has the injury concerns, but first off for the age concerns, it is a little concerning, but we have to keep in mind that these prospects are a part of the COVID era, which screwed everything up all that extra eligibility, it's, he's, he, yes, he is an uh, extra senior and he is very old, but it's not all his fault because he was dealing with those ACL injuries. He's still only 23 years old, which isn't crazy. Like Stetson Bennett, 25, or even some of these guys like Bo Nix, I believe is 24. And I just don't like banking on injuries. He's looked fine this year, being able to move. He's definitely not a mobile quarterback. But he just reminds me of a guy who's going to step in as a franchise guy, potentially, with all these quarterback needy teams. And I think he's just – his skill set looks like it's going to translate very well to the pros. Definitely needs some things cleaned up in his mechanics. But I think that he has all the intangibles, great ball power, great ball accuracy. I love panics all across the board. And in a super flex format, I'm going out and getting a starting quarterback, yeah, assuming he goes in the first round if I can. Yeah, I, you know, I don't love the Penix pick, but I respect your logic. And like I said, at this point in Dynasty rookie drafts, I feel like the draft board doesn't matter. Uh, you're at the point where it's like, all right, I'm going to take the shot on the guys that I believe in. Personally, where I'll go with the 109 is where the next quarterback I think should have been taken off the board. And that's Bo Nix out of Oregon. Uh, similar concerns, right? An older guy been in college football for a while but again like you said he's there for the COVID year we saw him at Auburn not be too great but show some flashes and then he gets to Oregon and is in Heisman conversations and I think that just kind of speaks to Bo Nix is the kind of guy that 
I want to see what team drafts him. If I believe it'll be the right situation, if there's an offensive minded head coach in place, you know, if Bo Nix were to go to new England, maybe I wouldn't believe in him as much at this spot, but if he were to find a home at say Atlanta, I think that Bo Nix could be a really, really solid player. To me, he's a much better version of what Mac Jones was coming out. I think Bo Nix is going to be who he is immediately, a little bit more athletic, a little bit better of an arm than Mac Jones, but the ceiling's not quite as high as it is for your Caleb Williams, Drake Mays, and Jaden Daniels. But I think he's a guy that you could certainly rely on in a super flex in the right spot. Yeah, I don't hate the logic there. I like Bo Nix as well. I'm just going Penix over him because one thing I want to mention is Bo Nix really peaked in his last year, but Penix had a better season last season, throwing for 4.6 thousand yards. It was just because Washington was so down bad as a team. They were not talked about at all. So Penix, even though he is old, he really peaked when he was 22 years old, which isn't bad at all. And he was just kind of staying in college for that extra year. That's why I have him above of Bo Nix because he's been doing that injury type stuff, which I think hopefully should be getting cleaned up. But at the 110, this is pretty easy selection for me now. I'm going to Mecca Egbuka. I'm not knocking him at all for the lack of production this year. Not even lack of production, just a little bit of a down year. And I'm blaming that all on Kyle McCord. I mean, let's be honest. McCord was terrible. And how are we expecting a Mecca Egbuka to have the same type of season that he did with CJ Stroud? as Kyle McCord. I mean, it's just obvious to me. McCord can't support two elite wide receivers, so Marv is still going to get his because he's better than a Mecca Egbuka, but Egbuka is definitely going to struggle because the quarterback play just simply isn't as good. He's been a great prospect. It looks like he's going to go in the first round of the NFL draft, late first, early second. Either way, I definitely like him a lot. He reminds me of that, you know, he's not a speed demon, but he's going to be, run routes really well and he's more possession type guy that can just catch a bunch of pass that's perfect for ppr so i really like a mecca buka here getting him at the back end of the first round yeah i saw some reports today that he might be headed back to ohio state so we'll see where that all ends up shaking out but i love him as a prospect um for me he's so jarvis landry-esque right you mentioned a ppr stud this guy is a zone beater. He finds that spot, gets open, and he'll pick up the first down. It's not a lot of flashy plays, but it's the right play. And that kind of guy could fit into any offense. You know, I think the NBA comp is Clay Thompson, right? He's not the star player on your team, but every team could use one. Uh, for my last pick here at the 111, I, I'm going to take my shot on Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU. Six foot five, 200 pounds, thousand yard receiver, 15 touchdowns. This guy is an absolute beast. And I think playing behind Malik Neighbors kind of might have underrated this guy. You remember out of LSU, we saw Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase on the same team. Two studs can come from the same school. Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave out of Ohio State very recently. I think it could be something similar here with Brian Thomas Jr., especially if he gets to go kind of later in the draft to perhaps a better situation quarterback-wise. Say Buffalo ends up grabbing him, pairs him alongside Stephon Diggs. Gabe Davis, Mr. Inconsistent, moves to a wide receiver three, and now you get Josh Allen a real red zone threat. We know it's not Diggs's full strength area. A six foot five, two hundred pounder paired with Josh Allen, those could be fantasy numbers. Oh yeah, I think if he goes with the Bills, I like him a lot more. He definitely has some concerns. We've seen these big body wide receivers be, you know, loved by the dynasty community because they look great, they test great, but you know, you honestly sometimes want those guys that are gonna rack up PPR points, not just yeah, play just that to address that role. concern though, for me, LSU wide receiver university, that that's the reason I'm willing to take the shot on them there. That's where it produces elite wide receiver talent. That's true. Well, I, yeah, it's really hard to knock him for that since he was playing with Malik neighbors, just a little concerned about the late breakout age as well. But I think the upside is going to depend on draft capital for me because the upside is sky high and to round things out. I'm going to, so I'm going to go Travion Henderson. It's not official that he's coming back to school yet, and he literally posted on his Twitter that he has not made an, uh, an official commitment either way. So he's my RB1. It's crazy. This is the first running back we're taking. 
You, yeah. You, you don't like this running back class either, I take it? Are you it's, running backs in Dynasty? I think it's we not, kind of agree on the same page. You know, I like running backs in Dynasty. I just don't – there's no B. John Robinson. There's no Jameer Agreed. Gibbs in this draft class. I think Henderson is a good RB. I don't think he's great. You know, I think it's tough to tell who's the one in this class too. Is it him? Is it Trey Benson? Is it Bucky Irving? You know, those three guys – really kind of all fall in the same tier for me, whereas wide receivers, longer shelf life for Dynasty, and I think some of the wide receivers that we named have higher ceilings at their position in terms of a tier than those running backs. I'd be shocked if any of those running backs ended up being, you know, RB1s within the first three years of their career, if I'm being honest. Yeah, you hit on it perfectly. It's just the fact that these wide receivers have a longer shelf life, and none of these guys are certified. Like, honestly, are any of these running backs even going to go in the first round of the NFL draft? Probably not. Maybe late first. So there's definitely no stud like Bijan and Gibbs last year. Okay, also assuming Henderson does go back to school, give me a little bonus content. My RB2 in the class is actually Braylon Allen because he has that bell cow size. And he broke out as a 17-year-old freshman. I don't even understand the math behind that. How he had 1,268 yards, 12 touchdowns as a freshman. At se- I don't. You, you know, worry don't about how quick he could uh-huh. adjust to the NFL level, though. Right. I Being agree. so young, you know, he's gonna be in there with some grown men. You, mm-hmm. you, you got a 17, 18-year-old getting tackled by Aaron Donald. You might make you rethink your uh, situation real quick. 100. That's so true. I I think it's just. I like the age a little bit because we've seen the age is honestly so important in Dynasty because people are falling off, you know, a cliff more than ever as soon as they hit that, you know, 26, 27, 28 age. And the second contract is huge. So, And I've RBs him- are becoming a dying breed, right. man. It's, you know, it's crazy. you talk about teams aren't spending first-round draft capital in real life. Why would I spend one in a Dynasty draft? when these NFL teams aren't taking these guys as real serious weapons anymore. 100%. Yeah, totally agree. I think that's going to wrap things up. So we're going to hit you guys with a two-round mock draft once we, you know, dive a little more in-depth into the film analysis. You know, it's we're not even done with the fantasy playoffs yet. So once that gets done, we'll be doing a bunch of mock drafts with landing spots, two-round mock drafts, eventually three-round mock drafts. So if you enjoyed the video, Please drop a comment what you thought of the mock draft. Call us an idiot if you if you believe it was trash. Drop a thumbs up. And again, thank you for coming on, Dylan. You're going to see a lot more of him on the channel. We're going to be bringing you guys amazing dynasty content all summer. So be sure to subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next one.